Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today earned her Bachelor of Music degree in vocal performance from San Jose State University and has performed leading roles in musicals and operas. When she isn't working with one of her 20 voice and piano students, she loves gardening, hiking, and baking sourdough bread. Crash, How I Became a Reluctant Caregiver, is her first book. Welcome to Authors Over 50. Rachel Michaelberg. Thank you, Julia. Great to be here. Rachel, our opening question on authors over 50 is always, so what took you so long to write your first book? <laughs> well, um, I didn't ever as, have the identity as a writer. Uh, I was, as you just said in my bio, I was um, a singer a performer, I did opera, I did musical theater. Um, I was also a cantor in a synagogue, so I was training kids to do their bar and bat mitzvah. I had adult choirs I was, uh, and children's choirs that I was conducting. Um, I had a very um, strong identity as a musician, as an actor um, in theater and in my synagogue work. Um, and it just never occurred to me. I, it, it was not a, a driving need as it is for, for so many writers. Um, until this traumatic event happened, uh, where in my um, husband of 10 years was involved in a small plane crash. Um, he, he survived it as, as well as the pilot. Um, but he sustained a very, very severe traumatic brain injury. The events spiraled out of control. And uh, I, after about three to four years, um, when things had settled down a little bit and um, I was coming out of survival mode, um, it just hit me that this story that I had to tell was uh, important. It needed to be told because the story is how I grappled with the the dilemma of becoming a caregiver to a full grown man um, with whom I had already begun to fall out of love. Our relationship was in trouble at the time. Um, our children were quite young, six and seven years old, and I. I came to the realization that, well, you'll have to read the book, but um, I grappled with the expectation that I would become his caregiver. And, and then I just, it just that the idea of writing it wouldn't leave me. I, I, I tried to deny it because I knew what, how much work it was to write a book. Uh, well, I didn't know from a personal experience, but I did know, I understood, I, I'm a, I've been an avid reader since I, I was a child and uh, adore reading and understand good writing and what it takes. And so, um, and I'd, I'd always considered myself comfortable with writing, good in English and always got, got A's in school in English. And however, I had no real skill as an adult. I had no, no training. So, uh, and yet I still, I, I started the process because I felt, I just felt this compulsion and that's why it took so long. Um, and, and I was probably 40, 48, 49 years old when I started to write and, and I didn't actually publish it until I was 59. So it took a long time to, to start it and <laughs> to finish it. 
Were you keeping journals? How did you begin the process? That's a yes, I wish I had. I absolutely wish I had. Uh, and in fact, that's one bit of advice I would give anyone who's considering writing a memoir is if you haven't already start start keeping a journal, it will be so much easier to remember what you were feeling or, or thinking or the, even the details of the, uh, the physical details of what was happening at the time, uh, which as we know as writers is so important to bring in all of those details. Um, so I did not keep a journal. Uh, I was, it was just all I could do to keep one foot in front of the other and, and ter take care of my children. Uh, in the book, I d describe um, physical uh, ailments, uh, medical emergencies I had shortly after, clearly caused by stress. Uh, and so that's part of the story that the response, physical response that I had, in addition to the emotional response, you know, it's hard to separate those two, right? They're very interconnected. Um, that was very, uh, that was a clear message to me about what I was capable or incapable of doing. Um, I needed to listen to my body and what was going on. So, well, it sounds like we're going to read a very truthful perspective. You know, I, I think when people become caregivers, they don't always say that they were reluctant caregivers. And so I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to be a very, honest um, perspective? Well, I have been told that, that, that my story is very direct, very honest, uh, raw. Um, and honestly, I didn't, I, I, I must have had very good writing teachers because that's what they, that was always the, uh, I won't say the assignment, but that was that was uh, what they charged us with. Uh, any anyone in their classes is is you always got to dig deeper. Okay, so you, you're you, fine. You're telling us how you felt, but what what were you really feeling, right? Um, and that's what brings uh, that's where the vulnerability comes in, and where the readers can relate, and the, the things that aren't said, right? So um, yeah, so I was really grappling with that reality um, facing me, which was, um, I was 40, I think I was 44 when it happened, 45, and um, facing my life as the caregiver to being um, really in charge of, because he, he, was, he was not able to be left alone at all. Um, he was, at the time, he was having seizures, he was incontinent, um, very unpredictable behavior. On one scene, I talk about how he actually, he, he was, he had come for a visit and he was, um, I noticed the car was gone and he had taken my car keys and had driven down the street. And it, luckily a neighbor caught him, but it was, you know, that's the kind of thing I would have had to deal with all the time. And, um, and I need to be re really honest with myself as far as what I was capable of and once you wrote this book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? Uh, so I chose a hybrid. Um, I had been working with, I had a little bit of trouble toward the end of the writing process, sort of putting it all together and uh, working in the final drafts. And so I hired an editor actually before I finished a, fi a so-called final draft. And um, and he uh, had a kind of old school editor who really encouraged me to go through the normal query process and try to get an agent and and do all of that. And I started to do that. I, I took I took a class on how to write a query letter, and I did you know I did all of that on the due diligence, and I started to query and. Um, Got some good responses, uh, really, I think, honest interest, but, you know, no, no bites. And around the same time, um, some of the, my writing colleagues, my writing peers had um, been publishing with a hybrid press called She Writes Press. And I decided to go ahead and submit to them. And they do, they do vet. They don't take everyone, um, every manuscript. So um, they did accept me and they loved it. And it just felt like a it felt like a good fit for me. Um, and this 
not to to release the stress of the que the whole query process and waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, I still had it still was a, close to two years before it actually published. Um, so uh, there was waiting involved, but um, I did f feel very comfortable with my with my choice. Well, they're a very uh, highly respected hybrid press. Exactly. Exactly. I thought if I'm going to go with a hybrid, then this is the one to do. Um, and I was I was thinking about self publishing, but I'm, I'm very glad that I made the decision I made. Well, also because they create such a community of women writers who really stay in touch with each other. Yes, that's that was a huge benefit that I had really no idea about that that would happen. And especially during the pandemic, because that's when I published in April of 2021. And um, it was sort of a lifesaver to to have those, those weekly meetings with my cohort. And and the other the other benefit was that she writes is traditionally distributed through Ingram. And so um, I was more confident that, about the distribution. Well, how did you get your writing accomplished with so many voice and piano students? How, what was your writing routine? Were you a morning person or a night person or in between the lessons person? <laughs> All of the above, <laughs> um, you know, and not having really any, any training or, 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 or process as a writer um, and being a single parent at the time. And can, my kids were, it was really their middle school and teenage years when I was doing most of my writing. Um, I I would drive my son to his breakdancing class and take a half an hour and go to the nearby coffee shop and try to get a page or so done. Um, my, my favorite way to make progress was um, going to retreats. Uh, when the kids would go, eventually their dad moved to Israel to be with his um, sister. Um, who was going to take care of him, I, um, I got a couple of weeks off. <laughs> and I would almost always try to sign up for a, a writing retreat during that time, or even a weekend, um, I would get them either friends to take care of them, or well, at, at one point, they were old enough, you know, when they're 16, 17, 18, I was able to get away. Um, and I was taking writing classes, which, which are great for, you know, when you're paying for a class, you want to show up with some work to mm -hmm. to read so that, you know, you're, you're getting the most out of the class. So, um, yeah, I when I realized that I needed to write this, write this story, I just started asking around about writing classes and found a teacher who I'm still with. I adore her. Um, and she also wrote a memoir recently and um, I just, just learned as I went along. It, it was, it was a very interesting process. And I found out that I love hanging out with authors, writers, because they're just really cool. <laughs> I, I too love writing retreats, you know, to have that free time to just sit and write or take classes in the morning and write in the afternoons. And, and it does give you some hard deadlines to have that material ready to, for someone to read the next day. So that really is most helpful. Oh, it really is. And, and at one of my retreats, we did a, a sand tray uh, exercise. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but there's there's a, you have a tray and it's got a bunch of sand in it and they have all these different little figurines and little artifact, little, you know, shells and, and all kinds of things. This room is filled with it. And you take, you, you, you tell your story, you take little figurines and you tell your story and, and it helps open your, your eyes to, oh, I hadn't thought of that, that this is this, how did this end up on my tray? You know, so interesting. So um, it, it's those retreats are great because they're not as you, you know, they're not just where you sit and write. There's all kinds of interaction. And what about publicity? Have you found anything that works or doesn't work? We writers don't necessarily like to promote ourselves. Yeah, I, I'm sure you can. You'll agree with me that it's it's I had no idea how hard it was and how what was involved. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid of promoting myself as an actor and as a person having been in the theater. It's we're, we're 
expected to, especially community theater, we're expected to promote our show, to get tickets sold and so on. Um, but yet I didn't have the confidence. I don't, you know, I was gaining the confidence as a writer. So um, what has worked? Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. I, I have done several podcasts and I really enjoy them. They're so much fun to meet these great interviewers and um, I do think that helps. Uh, I have um, I have done some Facebook advertising, a little bit of the Amazon advertising has not worked well for me. Um, tried to figure that out. Um, and uh, I'm in a, I'm in the process of understanding who my more specifically who my readers are. Um, I, in fact, I just hired a specialist, a marketing specialist to help me do that. Um, when you are preparing a book for publication, as you probably know, you are supposed to really zone in on who, zoom in on who are your ideal readers, what's the demographic, um, and yet apparently there's much even further you can go with that to try to find where those people are so that you can directly connect with them. So that's, that's my current goal. Well, it is so difficult. This is such a humbling industry. And that's one of the reasons is if a million books are published every year, how do we even get anyone to pick up ours? Yeah. And yet I feel like the, the, the topic of caregiving is, is, is huge. Um, most of the time we're caring for a parent. Um, rarely it does happen a spouse. Um, and yet as we age, that's more and more common. And um, I feel like it's a pretty universal topic, um, yeah. particularly with women. So um, because lucky us, we're the ones who usually do it, right? Very true. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your book set up the section that you're going to read for us today and let us hear your tone and voice in the book. Yes, I'd love that. So, uh, as I said, uh, he was in a, uh, his name is David. He was in a small plane crash. We'd been married for about 10 years. Um, my son was six and my daughter was seven at the time. Um, and this scene happens a few months after the crash, the crash happened in April of 2005. Um, and so this is happening in the summer and I'm, I'm really in this, as I said, um, deep in this survival mode of just trying to get through not just the day, but the next five minutes, you know. Um, everyone grills me about how the kids are doing. Always the first question they ask after inquiring about David. So innocent, so caring, so gentle so predictable yet i never know how to answer shitty fine managing resilient all of the above in truth i have no capacity to deal with hannah and joshi's emotional health beyond loving them meeting daily needs and keeping their lives as normal as possible i'm told i'll just know when it's time to get them some therapy late july it's hot as hell in our cute but pre-war house. The few ceiling fans pant to stir the smallest breeze. I let the kids off kitchen duty. I want to be alone, have a reprieve from their bickering. They're watching High School Musical for the hundredth time. Get your head in the game, sings Zac Efron, his teenage angst particularly irritating as I rinse forks and dishes. The pockmarks on the vinyl floor in dingy tile grout add to my annoyance at the goddamned useless fan. Suddenly, I'm gulping, sobbing, choking. I hate this kitchen, hate the dirty forks, hate Zac Efron, hate David for doing this to me. Most of all, hate myself for being so powerless. Mommy, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Hannah can feel my meltdown from the next room. She comes in and hugs me. Caught. I try so hard not to let them see me cry. I'm okay, honey. Stupid lie. I'm sad about daddy, I managed to be truthful. Hannah is pure compassion. She leans back, her little arms sweet around my waist and looks up at me. 
You don't have to cry on the outside. You can cry on the inside. That's what I do when I'm sad about daddy. Jesus, how long has she felt this way? The next day, I book her a therapy appointment. Wow, that is raw <laughs> and, and so truthful. I can, I can just see your life there. I, I felt like I was in your life. Yeah, it was a um, horrific time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the, everyone kept telling me I had to take care of myself. And yet I found that to be such a monumental task. Yeah. Um, just because they said, you know, it's that old, that old adage where if you're in a plane and you, you know, you've got to put your own oxygen mask or you're not going to be able to help your, those, your children or those with you. Um, and yet just the act of putting on my oxygen mask was like, how do I do that? <laughs> what exactly am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Um, it was, yeah. So, um, yeah, but you know, we got through it and kids yeah. are doing great and, um, they're 25 and 23 now. So, uh, you say, you know, when you're walking through hell, just keep walking. And yeah. Well, you know, when, when I have friends or family members who have gone through something and, and I try to be comforting to them and I find myself saying these mundane statements, these, you know, things that were said to me when something happened to me. And I'm just thinking that is of no use whatsoever. Why do we even know, say those I things know. to anybody? But we're, we're so lost. We don't know what to, to, to say and how to help. It's true. It's, um, people don't know what to say. Yeah. They just don't. Mm -hmm. And, um, so all they can do is just say, I'm here. I love you. Um, let me, you know, and, and, you know, rather than let me know what I can do to help say, can I, um, I'd like to bring you a meal on Tuesday yeah. <laughs> or, or Wednesday, you know, and what, what, what are your, do you have any food restrictions? You know, I've learned that actually. Yeah. Some, that was, some specific, something concrete. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Because you're, you're in such a state, you don't even know what you need, no. you know, and then until someone offers. Well, what about writing a memoir? And you mentioned families who didn't, uh, family members who didn't understand. Um, wh what did they think of, of the book? I know sometimes these can be very touchy subjects with families. They absolutely can be. Uh, and I was quite concerned. However, my relationships had already changed with uh, many of these people. They had gone through some very, very rough patches, uh, almost destroyed. Um, and yet, by the time the book was published, they were mostly repaired, never, never would be the same. Um, because of some of the, the decisions that I made. Uh, however, we had we were civil and we were, we had moved past it for the most part. Um, and so I did send the, the one in particular that I was worried about was my sister in law, who is a, is a very main character in my book. Her name is Dora. Uh, she lives in Israel and um, who I had adored before all of this happened. We had a very close relationship, despite the fact that we were in different continents. Uh, uh, and um, I sent her the book before it was published. I sent her a, an ARC, you know, an advanced reader copy. Um, with a with a with a letter telling her how much I appreciated everything she did for David, everything she continues to do for David, um, how I I really believe in her heroism. Actually, I never got a response, and and I decided that was okay. Maybe she just didn't know how to respond, um, and so. But I felt better about that I had made the effort to to get to have her look at the book first. I wasn't, it wasn't going to change anything. It's not like she was going to say, oh, I, you shouldn't publish this. I was still going to publish it, but mm -hmm. I felt like it was important to do that. Um, and others, uh, my sis, uh, another sister-in-law um, who has a barely mentioned, but she, she actually, she lives in Germany and she actually offered to, to translate the book. 
<laughs> and I was like, if there's a German market, I would love that. But I, I, I haven't been able to figure out how to break into the German market, um, even though there's quite a bit of mention of Germany and, um, and uh, German culture. And I, some of the book takes place in Munich. So I would love what, that. Do, what do you think the best money you've ever spent as a writer was? Hmm. I believe it was hiring my editor um, even before I finished because again, I, I was just feeling it. I was floundering a bit. I, so one thing I hadn't, haven't mentioned, it did take me 11 years to write this book, uh, partly because it's, it's not a very flattering picture of me. And the number two was I got very discouraged about midway through. I just felt like I didn't know what I was doing. So I stopped cold for two years, um, two full years. I didn't write a word. And then the book wouldn't leave me alone. It just, the story kept at me. So I finished it, but the way that I finished it, I, I realized I needed guidance. I needed a coach. So I hired um, one of the teachers who had been at one of the writing retreats um, that I'd attended. And um, I, I was, it was, the, best thing I did because I felt like I had a cheerleader in my corner. Um, I felt like I just, I had, whenever I had a question, I was able to, you know, shoot him a, a scene or something and he would just encourage me and sort of, and then, and then we actually ended up changing around, uh, like the, 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 the opening of the scene became completely different. We, you know, we, we met at a coffee shop. This was actually during the pandemic wearing masks and, and um, moving, moving, shuttling papers around all over this enormous table, <laughs> you know, um, and he was just, I just felt so much more secure with, with his guidance. Well, I just have to applaud all of you writers who write memoir, because if I thought I had to put my truth and my life down on paper, I just don't know. I, I know it's got to be therapeutic, but I don't know if I could see it staring back at me. So I applaud you for being able to write your truth. Well, and I applaud you fiction writers for the imagination. I just had to kind of remember what happened and then embellish it a little bit. But you, you have to sort of, you have to create this whole story and, and um I'm looking forward to reading yours, by the way. It's on my Kindle. Thank you so much. Do you have any other books in you? Um, I have an idea, but I, it's again, it's fiction, it's historical fiction based on, based on fact, uh, based on my family history, but, um, I don't think it's going to happen right away. I'm leaving the door open. Well, Rachel, our last interview question is always, are writers over 50 or a unique set? Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? Well, of course, the obvious, uh, you have, you may have a few wrinkles, but you have experience. Uh, you have, uh, you've walked the walk, talked the talk, you've done it all. And so none of it, uh, is is out of bounds as far as uh, what you can use in your writing, whether it be fiction or, or memoir, or um, you can, if, if you can remember it, you can write it. And even if you can't remember it fully, that's okay. You can, it, some of it will come back to you as you start writing. And, uh, and if not, then some of the other details can be added. Um, I certainly didn't remember every single word that was said, uh, you know, 15 years earlier or 10 years earlier. So uh, I just reimagined. So that's number one. Um, and I would say this is advice for all writers, uh, which is a, what yet another writing teacher, uh, the advice was if you ask yourself the question, and this is particularly for memoir, who was I kidding? This is how I really felt or this was what I was really feeling. You know, I was really feeling resentful. I was really feeling jealous. I was, you know, things that you aren't proud of admitting because again, circling back to what I said earlier, that's where the real, that's where the real truth 
comes from and 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 therefore the connection with your readers because they have inevitably felt that way as well if they're being honest with themselves so um yeah that would be my advice well i just thank you so much for that advice and for sharing your story with us today i think this is an important book and i think so many people who are in the same situation or similar situations are going to reap so much from from your truth and so we just appreciate your putting it out there for everyone to see and to to benefit from and we are happy that you're now one of our authors over 50. thank you thank you for joining us today Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.